Hi, everyone. Welcome to this bi-weekly mastermind call. My name is Natalie Luniva, and I am a growth coach, and I help SaaS founders get unstuck, clarify marketing priorities, and grow high-performance teams. I'd like to welcome my guest, Helen Pitfield, a conversion copywriter. She helps SaaS and B2B uh, subscription services to increase signups on your website, also help try convert trial to paid conversion and also optimize the landing pages so that you stop wasting your ad spend. Thank you very much for taking the time to share your experience and wisdom, Helen, and welcome to this uh, SaaS boss community. Thank you for having me, Natalie. You know, right? <laughs> so today we're going to talk about copy conversion optimization. And I see very often copy written by the founders. And so it is either a very technical talking about, you know, what platform the, they build their software on, or they're speaking to a very technical persona while their target market may not necessarily be a very technical persona. So tell us what it is that you see working with uh, SaaS companies as a, as a whole, and also give us a quick summary of what we'll be talking about. Yeah, you're spot on really. And you know, let's be honest, it's it's really hard to write your own copy. And especially for early stage startups and, and fast businesses, you are going to use the resources you have, right? Which is very often you and maybe a, a one or two other people in the business. So it's a really tricky task to take on. I'm going to cover... I've promised the seven deadly sins that are killing your conversions, which sounds a bit of a clickbaity headline. But the reason I wanted to talk about these seven things is copy and messaging is different for everybody. And there is no like one quick fix. So I'm going to talk about these things that do kind of affect everybody. So yeah, do you want me to dive in? Yeah, take it away. I um, Everyone should be able to see your screen now. Natalie did a great job of introducing me. So thank you for that. So, you know, who am I? I've been writing copy for seven years. And before that, I used to work at an ad network. Um, so an ad tech company managing campaigns for big B2C brands where they had the luxury of loads of budget could test everything. And um, everything was kind of easy and fun. You can, you know, test just about everything. And now I'm working with B2B SaaS companies. And there are some parts of what I've learned before that I've taken with me about biopsychology and certain other parts, but a lot of it has been completely new for me. But, you know, I've built up knowledge over the last five years. I'm, I'm honing in more and more on SaaS companies and really don't take on other clients. So a bit of mentoring and consulting as well and co-founded with my friend Mark Colgan, the product on borders, which is why you're going to see this logo everywhere. And in between that, I am constantly worrying about my tea supply chain problem because I live in the middle of the Gulf of Thailand. And the reason there's a dog picture is simply because I have four dogs. They may join the call it's not intentional, but it's a little bit of a warning for you. So you'll probably join this call. You've seen the headline. If, you, if you're listening now or you're watching on replay, you're like, oh, great copywriter. She's going to give us this, you know, secret formula. She's promised, you know, it sounds very secret formula-esque. But the one big secret formula is there is no one magic formula. But there is a guiding set of principles. So I mentioned I live in Thailand, but when I first came to Thailand, I came as a tourist. I didn't need to know everything, but I needed to know, I needed some grounding. So I had this very worn out, fun, well-thumbed uh, Lonely Planet guide. And in it, I had the basics of what I needed, like social etiquette, things I wanted to see, a bit of a kind of a, a map, you know, of, of what I, I needed to do and see and how to behave in Thailand. So there are some things that underpin uh, good copy and good messaging for all SaaS businesses. In fact, pretty much all B2Bs. So that's what I wanted to touch on. So I'm going to just run through very quickly what we're going to touch on. These are the seven deadly sins, but I'm going to go into more detail. So positioning, logic versus emotion, headlines, sloppy CTAs, imagery. Yes, I'm a copywriter. I can't design, but Imagery is part of it. It's all part of the story and um, the promises you make and value gaps. So let's talk about poor positioning. There's no point in going into a, any kind of copywriting exercise if you don't have the foundations right. As you can see, that's a very beautiful building. It looks very well designed. It looks like it was fit for purpose at some point, but the foundations are all wrong. So now it's not doing the job it was intended to do. And the same is, is the case for your, for your copy. 
So I promise this is the only Venn diagram in the whole thing. So what you need to figure out first is your unique value prop. But I also wanted to highlight something that you need to avoid. So you've got the three big circles of what you do well, what your customers want, and what your competitor does well. And then there's a bunch of crossover in between. Your unique value prop is what you do well and what your customers want. And then there's a kind of a, a difficult, tricky zone down here where there's a the sad face. This is what your customers want and your competitor does well, but you're left out in the cold. Um, then there's the red UVP, which I am calling the useless value prop. It's what you do well and your competitor does well, but nobody actually wants it. And the reason this happens in SaaS is because when you're starting out, one of the first things that you do is you go and look at competitor sites, right? You need somewhere to start and you feel like that's the best place to start. By no means am I saying you shouldn't look at competitor sites, but the way you look at them should always be in line with what your customers actually want. Because otherwise it could be a case of the blind leading the blind. They may not know any better than you do what your, what your customers really want. The same happens with your with feature requests, right? Or, or trying to decide what you're going to do next or prioritize in your product development. So that's the useless value prop you want to avoid. And then there's this kind of battleground area in the middle where the, the question marks are. This is where you do it well, your competitor does it well, and your customers want it. And um, so while you want to focus primarily on your unique value prop, there's also an opportunity in this very central zone where it could be a case of you just messaging something better than your competitor does and you winning out on that. A prime example is, for example, Drift, who have got really, really clever messaging and they've really kind of tapped into something that their competitors haven't. So they may have as good or, or maybe not even as good uh, features and benefits for some people, but they're winning on messaging. So that's the positioning trap that you need to avoid. And this is where you need to be. So from those circles, you can see, obviously, like the really important thing is you need to know all about your customers. You need to know all about them. You need to understand their awareness levels. You need to understand the maturity of your own market. So this goes around and around and around in copywriting circles, but I'm not sure how well known it is outside of advertising, marketing and copywriting fields, the five stages of awareness. So there are there are people that you want to spend most of your time and money and budget on marketing to. And then there are people where it's a bit of a money pit. And, and the, you know, the easiest people to market to are people who know your product and they already know that your product can do what they need it to do. And they just need to know the offer. So though that, that's sort of easy. And, and when people talk about, Oh, what's the ideal copy length or, you know, what needs to go on the page? You need to think about these awareness levels before you decide, you know, any of that, because there's no point in writing something, you know, 10,000 words on why somebody needs a CRM if they know they need a CRM and they know your brand already. And, and, and then it goes into the product aware. They know what you sell, but they're not sure if it's right for them. They are also good people that for you to market to that could be hitting your homepage. Solution aware. They know what they want. They know the outcomes they need, but they don't yet know your product provides it. And these are people that may have found you through search, for example. Then you've got problem aware. They know they have a problem, but they don't know there's a solution. That's a little bit more tricky and maybe something to consider, you know, building towards as you build out things like SEO content, you know, and inbound marketing. But it's not necessarily where you want to focus your attention on on your homepage. And then you've got the completely unaware people who don't really know anything about having a problem. <laughs> they may have an opinion. Um, they know their name. They know where they live. They're, they're not completely unaware, but they, <laughs> they don't, they're not ideal to market to. It would be very expensive. And that's why you don't see ad agencies doing that. The next thing you need to understand about your customers after, after understanding their, their awareness level is that they're human beings, right? So, you know, we get this problem a lot with 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 copy. And, and Natalie, you mentioned this, that we often have a tendency, especially, you know, if we're technical people, to reel off a load of facts um, and, and, and stats and forget about the fact that humans actually buy partly on emotion. And, and it's a difficult thing to admit because we like to think of ourselves as, you know, highly evolved beings who 
bring logic to the table every time we make a buying decision. But there's an emotional undercurrents when we're making decisions. We still bring logic. We still apply logic before we make a purchase in most cases, especially in B2B. But we need to think about the human emotional side. I've used Spock because he's half human, half Vulcan. So yeah, he's somewhere in the middle. So you need to understand your customer's mindset. And to do that, um, there are three main buckets. And and I do this a lot with my customers. I go off and, and help them with research, but this is absolutely something you can do yourselves. You need to understand their pain points. And this is probably something a lot of you are familiar with through, you know, if you're familiar with the jobs to be done framework, you know, you're un- you understand something about your customer's pain points and you need to, that needs to be reflected in your copy. You need to show like mirror it to them on the page right so when they find your copy and and your brand they go you get me I'm in the right place you can solve my problems you also need to think about their desires and often people forget about the pain part and they don't want to talk about pain and copy and they just want to focus everything on desires the other thing the other pitfall with focusing on desires is People often look at the surface de- desires. So, for example, use, I'll use CRMs as a, again. It's top of mind for some reason. <laughs> Maybe I need a new one. So y- it might seem like, oh, they need a CRM because they need to get the jobs done quicker or they want better reports. But actually, there's often underlying reasons people want to buy. And those reasons could be different for different personas or different use cases within your audience. So one person might just want to get out of work on time to go home and feed, you know, read to their kids. Somebody else might be trying to build, you know, the next unicorn and they want to buy a super yacht. And that's why they need a CRM that will help them boost sales and get more revenue. So you need to think about, you need to understand that. It doesn't always mean that you're going to put, oh, buy this CRM, you can go home and read to your kids. But it does help you have a picture of that person in your head and how they're feeling when you talk about the pain points they want to avoid and where they want to be. And then you've got triggers. Sorry, had to have. <laughs> so what is it that sends people off in a frenzy, right? There has to be something like some event to make them go looking for a solution like yours. I, I have a question. I'm sure lots of founders have the same question. So how do we go about learning the struggles and the desires of our customers and then you know probably this is something that they can tell us right but what about also triggers like this is not something that they would tell us how do we learn this so you you can find out if you catch people early enough for interviews you know we we get obsessed with quantitative data you know i'm a bit obsessed with things like hot jar and um watching what users are doing you can often find out by doing one to one interviews which i know a lot of people want to avoid People prefer to send surveys. Surveys are great. But I have found out what has triggered people through doing one-to-one interviews. It's something that gets missed off off a lot when I watch um, jobs to be done interviews that other people have conducted. This question, you know, what was happening? So a really good question is, what was happening in your life that made you go looking for a solution like this? As simple as that. Be careful not to ask because you'll get a time-based answer. I went looking in January. But if you ask, you know, for example, I, I, I would really like to be able to invoice from my phone more easily because I'm, I work with international clients like you, right? And sometimes I just want to pop a quick invoice off. And I was, I was going through a really busy period and I tried to do it several times with the, the product I use. And I hadn't been able to do it. And I think it was like on the third attempt. And I had to get up from the bed where I've been watching Netflix and turn my computer on. Because, you know, you want to wind down. Even though you're working from home, you want you have cutoff points. So the, you can see all my pain here. I'm, put, I'm spilling out my guts just from asking myself, you know, what were the triggers? The triggers were I was sick of trying to, you know, opening up my computer again just to send an invoice that is the sa- same sort of invoice I send to a client every month just want you know so the trigger was kept getting this pain over and over again it was interrupting my Netflix time had to boot up my computer right so that was the trigger the event there can be other triggers as well like um, seeing a special offer if they are in that um, highly aware, highly aware segments the like the ones and twos so they already know about your product and your solution and then showing them like a special offer at the right time could be a trigger so 
there's lots of different things that set people off and you will get uh, like every different kind of answer yeah well, it yes. does but i have a follow-up question so i know that you usually do those interviews with the clients to get a better understanding of their pains and their struggles how do you go about like how do you really open up the conversation and ask them for such a commitment because it is commitment on their side yeah so I think people worry about it unduly right so um, it depends how many customers you've got and how close you've been you know with them you know with bigger with you know if I've got somebody who's lucky enough to have a few thousand users then I will start with a survey and one of the questions will be at the end would you be open to a call but not everybody has that luxury so usually you want to pick people that have have purchased from you in the last few months or signed up in the last few months and because they'll they'll remember they're more likely to remember the triggers and you know the pain they had before and and you just ask I've got an email template you know that I give to my clients that they can send out you can also incentivize people you can you know you can offer them a little treat you know for for talking to you maybe there's you know some something you can give away that's part of your product for a bit or you know sometimes we will just take an amazon gift card or nothing at all because they the, if you frame it as we want to hear from you because we want to make the product better for you you know it's not just we're not just asked grilling you because we want to write really good copy but we also want your feedback about the product this is your chance to tell us everything you've wanted to tell us about our product and you ask them some questions about product and you will get people who will actually who actually want to do it and you keep the interview short like 20 minutes you know yeah. and and you you can ask people in the beginning do you have a hard stop and if they say no 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 then you can probably reel a lot more out of them but you you make the promises to to cut it off at 20 minutes right and then you give them the they've got the out after 20 minutes okay okay so let's talk about unhelpful headlines it's really hard writing headlines you know I'll spend a lot of time working on headlines and you know I might have working headlines in mind but it's often a thing that I will do last and one of the wonderful things about working out your unique value prop is that if you're early stage you know rewording your unique value prop can give you a headline. Other headline formulas that work really well, for example, are achieve X desire, which we've already spoken about and found out what that is. Achieve X desire without painful outcome, you know, or painful struggle that you've been dealing with. So I did an interview with Yarun from Salesflare, CEO of Salesflare, and he said, you know, the pain for for his users is that they're sick of filling things out in a CRM. This is probably why I keep going on about CRMs because he's he's in my head. So, you know, a headline for him might be, you know, improve your sales power without the pain, you know, get more sales closed without filling in loads of data in a, all day in your CRM, you know, but written better. So that's a, an ideal headline format. But I'm not just talking about that, like that big big bit of headline like I've got up here headlines and hero section it's also the supporting copy that you've got underneath kind of to me that counts as headline copy so when I go to somebody's site these are the first few things I look for I want to know what it is what your product is who it's for and why I should care so yeah another dog picture granted so if it these are the questions they've come here they've got in their heads and you need to be able to answer that in at least in the hero section we call either the hero section or above the fold so yeah do, do you have any questions about headlines because that was quite quick but we can always pick apart some headlines for fun later no questions okay so your next enemy your next sin to overcome sucky cta again this is really problematic and you're not alone in feeling like this you know if you've you've been looking at blogs and asking your peers and probably talking amongst yourselves you hear so many different things about what makes a good CTA you know how many should there be where should they be placed you know is there a magic color that makes people click on it or a specific size what words should be on it and in the end people keep telling you to a b test which is only helpful if you're getting lots and lots of conversions and and you just go around in a circle and it's really really difficult so you're sitting here thinking oh, you know which what's the right answer for me and actually there's going to be a different answer for everybody and and every situation apart from this one underlying thing and that is 
to think about it from your customer's point of view. So there's you thinking about how do I get them to do the thing I want them to do? And they're thinking, why should I do this thing, right? So that's the one truism for all of your customers when they're looking at your button. Now, luckily for a lot of SaaS, you're giving something, you're giving some value, you're giving a free trial, you're giving a demo, maybe you're asking them to watch a video. <laughs> Excuse me. So you are giving them something, but you need to maybe give them a bit more than start a 14 day free trial. So here's, a, here's how to flip that on its head and how to think about CTAs from now on. Stop thinking about them as a call to action or an ask and start seeing them as something that you're offering to the reader, right? So you're giving them something. You're not asking something from them. And when you think of it like that, it completely changes the way you write your CTA. So yeah, I've still got, this is a variant that I've worked on with, with a client and a strategist. And here we've reminded people of the pain that they told us in the voice of customer data that they felt. they This is for a, a, a tool that helps you manage revision requests with clients and communicate with your clients. So are you ready to stop fighting fires and get back to wowing your customers, which was one of their desires. They wanted to impress their customers and feel good, right? So, you know, the CTA isn't just the button. You can make big waves by reminding people why they should start the free trial. If you can add in a risk reducer, like, you know, if there's no credit card required, all the better, because then we're going to overcome hesitations. Hesitations isn't part of this presentation. We could do a whole other one on that. But the ultimate goal is to give them value and, and tell them why. And often I'll see things like videos as well that, that don't even tell you why you should watch the video. So, you know, why do people want to watch a video? Oh, see, how, it could be something really simple, like see how it works in under 30 seconds. You've got a short video that can explain it in 30 seconds, like see how it works in 30 seconds. You know, that's, that's a CTA worth that, that, that gives value instead of being an ask. So I'm going to talk about imagery despite my obviously terrible design skills, as you can see from these slides. But I work with designers when I'm working with copy, usually. So, and it, it makes up a big, big part of your messaging. And it's, it's often, you, people fall into two camps. They either sort of a design first people or copy first people. Your ideal situation is that your copy, you're, when you're writing your copy, you're thinking about the design as well, or you're working with somebody who's really good at that, or good at at least the layout and and helping you make things look nice. But it's not just about things looking pretty. There's the sin. This is the sin of sameness, and you know these are people in all different. These are all shot in different places, right, with different people, but they all look the same. And stock photos do not do anything to help your brand. They look like stock photos. Everyone knows it's a stock photo. And you usually using up prime real estate on the top of your website. And often I'm still seeing stock photos when there are so many other things you could do instead. So I was going to show you these live and I'm sure you're all familiar with these websites. But uh, yeah, some because of some, what's this tool called? <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to do it in this tool. So I've taken some screenshots. <laughs> Sounds good. Let's do it. So, so let's have a look at Hotjar. So what Hotjar does is they have, you, you're missing out on the fact that this is animated down here. They haven't gone with the usual, you know, it's up in the top right hand corner, but it's above the fold and you can see something is going on. So they're showing like a product image. And I really love it when you can see a, an inside the tool image like this. And it's, it's an easy thing for you to do, especially if you're a startup, is to show somebody the value of your tool by taking a screenshot of your tool. You don't even necessarily have to animate something. But if you can show them some, something inside the tool that backs up your headline and your unique value prop, it's easy. Look, Hotjar is doing it and they're really famous. So, you know, if it, it, although I say, you know, don't always take it as read that it's working because you see it somewhere else. I do see it on a lot of these kinds of sites that are, you know, well-known brands. Mm. Then you've got Slack and they've got kind of like this hybrid thing going on of having nice, friendly human faces. We're kind of programmed to, to like seeing faces on a page. It makes us trust something, even though these faces have nothing to do with you know, anybody at Slack, but we're just hardwired to, to kind of connect with that immediately. And this, they've got little animation here as well, which shows you, you know, a conversation in action. So it's a way of showing their product 
exp the experience of the product and some of the value of the product without having to do the whole usual block image or video tour that I think is quite cool. And I don't think that, you know, sometimes you have to be a bit careful looking at sites like Slack or huge, huge brands like this. But I think that this is something that's doable for a lot of a lot of early stages as well, because it could just be sim as simple as a little animated run through. And then you've got the rule breakers, right? You've got drift. So, you know, usually you wouldn't just have a big person there, you know, because we're talking about tech. But and it feels like a break from the rules, but it's not. Because if you work your way back to their unique value prop, everything about Drift is about being human. You know, this whole conversational marketing thing that they talk about. And so seeing this friendly face with the Drift shirt on looking super approachable, that actually plays into the brand. You know, they've got the advantage as, as well of a lot of people already knowing who Drift is and what the tool might be like before they get here because their marketing game is so strong and they're, you know, that. This is about the market maturity thing as well. But there is a certain charm to this, you know, that it that it still fits within the brand. So this is what I'm saying is you need to kind of go back and do a sanity check with your unique value prop, your customers, your brand and everything else before you choose your images. Does that make sense? Let's talk about promises. Um, you need to make promises in your copy, but people are a little bit scared of doing it. So it feels like a problem when you're doing it. It's good to make big promises as long as you can back them up. And by big promises, I'm talking about, you know, what outcomes you're going to deliver and be, be specific where you can. You know, if you know that you're saving people 10 hours a week, say 10 hours a week, you know, or, you know, make it as specific as you can, but you're going to need to prove it. You know, especially the, the bigger the promise, the bigger the proof has got to be. And that's, I know, again, very difficult when you're early stage, and that's why you need to start collecting it as quickly as possible. And pr but proof doesn't just have to be testimonials, case studies, etc. You know, as you grow and you start to get bigger user counts, that could be something, or maybe it could be something transactional. You know, maybe you've got a social media tool and you have helped your clients schedule, you know, a, a thousand messages that week or two thousand messages that week. That's a kind of proof in itself as well. There's also like the kind of like the workaround for super early stage. So if you are you know, talking about specific problems, then you can use external quotes or stats or something from a study to kind of back things up. So, oh, whose testimony was that? Okay. Mm -hmm. so this is an example we've used. That we're very lucky. Somebody sent us a very short video testimonial. It's got a number in it, a number that means something to my ideal customers. Um, so you can, you know, absolutely ask people to just shoot a really quick video on Loom. If they are not camera shy, they will do it. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're making the testimonial about how amazing they are, you know, and making them the hero, your customer the hero, they will be willing to do it. I just wrote a case study that's just been approved for a company that hit headlines this year for being valued at six billion for my client, the end client is this big unicorn and people will it because it, it makes them look good as well as long as you write it in that way that they look good so you know it's not that the product on board has got this result it's that these guys WooClap got this result so it's easy to get people to sign it off when you frame it the right way you've got case studies this is not me this is my friend Joel Kletke who you've had on and you've met before Natalie yes. Yeah, so because I'm a little bit intimidated by how amazing his case studies are, I just thought I'd just take a screenshot and promote his. And why not? So the sooner you can start getting case studies, the better. You know, don't wait. Don't lean back on it. Don't be intimidated either by the idea that you always have to have big, these big numbers and these, you know, on the, on the right hand side, you've got all these like big numbers mm -hmm. going on. But there are other outcomes that people want too, you know. So on this side, you know, increasing customer satisfaction. Satisfaction. If that's what your ideal customer wants, you can write a success story around that. So don't be intimidated or put off if you don't have hard numbers to share. This is an example where I said, you know, you can use counts. Okay, so it's Shopify, right? So it's easy for them. They've got a million businesses worldwide. You don't really need much more social proof because of where they are and how famous they are. They don't need to have a billion testimonials, you know, floating about near the top 
they've got a million customers worldwide. And this is from a friend's website. He has a reviews tool which helps coaches gather reviews for their sites. And he used the statistic approach because he was really early on and didn't have the kind of proof that you want to have from customers' mouths. So he's used a stat that he's found elsewhere. If you can find something from like Gartner or Forrester or something like that, all the better. But you can use quotes from famous people, authorities in the field, and things like that to help back up your claims. Okay, number seven, we're nearly done with this phase. So you've done all of this work. You've written all this amazing copy. You've got people maybe to take action, I hope right? They clicked on the button, you've got them hyped, you've made the right promises, you've told them that this is the thing they need, and they're really excited, they click on the button, and then nothing, right? You, if you create, if you don't live up to the promises that you've made on that site, it's the same feeling when you've clicked on an email, right, with a really cool looking subject line or a subject line that's a bit of a trick, like made out that they've replied mm-hmm. to you. You remember that old tactic and that it was a reply and then you click on it and then you're just like, oh, boo hiss, right? <laughs> you're not happy at all. So, you know, what you're promising in your copy has to match up with what the experience you're giving inside the product. For example, if you've promised this is so easy, you can set it up in five minutes or it's so easy, you know, there's no code. You don't need any technical know-how to do this. You better make sure that somebody with no technical know-how has done that and achieved that in the in the time you've promised. So yeah, that's what I mean by value gaps. Don't let people fall down that hole because it doesn't then, then it doesn't matter anything else that's happened before. So that's kind of like the next phase in the journey. I have a question. So you mentioned okay. about the hotline, I think uh, bullet point number four, who is it for to include it in the headline? Now, what if we serve multiple personas, multiple industries? And that's a case in uh, with many founders that I work with that they do not have, they maybe they have one ideal persona, but they also want, do not want to abandon everyone else. So how do we call out specifically some personas not abandoning everyone else. Yeah, this is this is not an easy one, right? So it's really easy. For example, I've got a mindset coach who is a copywriter and she's like, I'm the mindset coach that copywriters go to. And that's it. Super easy, right? But for people with multiple personas, it's not so easy. So, but there will be some unifying things among your personas, hopefully, that you can kind of shine as a beacon. So it could be that they share an outcome, a desired outcome, or it could be that they share a desired pain. So you don't necessarily have to say, you know, for copywriters, it could be for freelancers, or it could be for for people who are, are stuck in taking their business to the next level. You know, okay, that's a bit of a vague one. But, you know, that's what I share with everybody else in that mindset group. There are people who are not copywriters that are freelancers, but we've all got this kind of same problem. And 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 that's 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 something that you need to work out when you're doing your strategy. And yeah, it's not an easy one to solve and not one I can necessarily solve without doing all your research and figuring out what's the most important thing to prioritize. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you so much for all this time and uh, all of those nuggets and wisdom. This has been great. I look forward to chatting with you sometime soon. Yeah, I look forward to it too. I'm going to go and have a cup of tea, even though it's like nearly one o'clock in the morning, but <laughs> I'm really thirsty after talking. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.